I'm Sarah Matches. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics here at uh, TCOM. I've been here for 17 years. Um, I went to school here, took a break away, and then came back. So um, I'm glad to be here today to speak to you all. We're talking today about reducing the risk of preventable diseases by uh, using vaccines. So let's start with the diseases themselves. Um, does anybody recognize this? All right, it says hacking, 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 <laughs> hacking, 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 <laughs> and at the end the child kind of gives a huge cough and then basically vomits because of all the sputum they brought up out of their lungs. So uh, this is looking at pertussis, all right. Um, we know that pertussis was a big deal years ago. Unfortunately, we're seeing a rise in pertussis cases again, and you can see by this um, by these articles, these are just two examples. There's multiple across the United States. Um, the one in Washington was in April of this year. The one in East Texas was in May of this year. And we're just seeing a rising incidence of pertussis around the United States, little pockets uh, in different areas. And so that's important to be aware that that is something, it's not just a disease of the past. It is a current problem that we have. Anybody ideas on this, fact, this disease? Measles. All right. So we know that when the uh, measles vaccine was implemented, there was a dramatic drop. And you can see looking at the arrow here, as, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. As it comes down, uh, just in a few year period, we had a dramatic drop with implementation of the vaccine. And then it stays very low with a couple of little peaks here and there. This particular peak uh, between 89, 90, 91, um, was pretty high. You can see it was uh, almost up to 30,000 cases, and a large percentage of those cases were here in Texas. Um, so it is something that we still see outbreaks of. If you look at this, um, at the Super Bowl this year, uh, there were two individuals that went to the Super Bowl park or something, the area outside the Super Bowl where people did different activities. They were infected with measles, and they then, then exposed, obviously, lots of other people at that time. Uh, and there came to be about 13 confirmed cases associated with that incident. Um, there was concern about the Olympics being a source of a measles outbreak because of the number of people who were traveling to Europe at that time. Uh, measles tends to be uh, much, the rate of measles is much higher in Europe than it is here. And so it's very possible for those, for individuals who have not been vaccinated um, to acquire measles and then bring it back to the United States. Fortunately, that did not happen. Um, but it is something we, we have concern with when we have those kind of events taking place. This is a good example to show you uh, what happens when you have a measles case, a measles outbreak. This individual is a three-year-old girl who was not vaccinated, and she went to Kenya. Uh, when she came back, she went back to daycare. Uh, the following day, she broke out in a rash. Um, measles rash, obviously. Uh, from that, three children at the daycare center came down with measles, exposed more family members, and it spread from there. Uh, in her own family, one individual got measles, uh, went to the hospital, two individuals in the emergency room, workers in the emergency room got measles, uh, spread it to other individuals um, who were from a homeless shelter that they had interacted with, and it spread from there. There came to be 23 cases um, uh, I can't remember, she traveled in February, and as of July, there were 23 cases associated with her um, bringing the disease back. 14 children wound up in the hospital as a result of this. Um, so you can see how it spreads, and it just keeps going out and out and out. Complications of chickenpox, varicella. Now, if you're like me, in my practice, a lot of parents will say to me, what's the big deal about chickenpox? I had it when I was a kid, and I did just fine. It's no big deal. Unfortunately, not everybody does just fine. It can be a big deal. Uh, one of the primary complications we can see is a secondary bacterial infection with staph or strep. Um, this can be a devastating infection, and it's very 
um, critical to try and avoid those, especially if you have a patient who's immunocompromised or something. This can even be a fatal disease. Um, you can have CNS effects. They can develop pneumonia. Uh, congenital varicella syndrome, which is when the mother has chickenpox at the time she delivers and then the baby uh, is exposed to chickenpox. And certainly zoster, when the virus remains dormant and then resurfaces later. Um, polio. Polio was a huge problem. We've all seen pictures of the iron lungs and the kids in braces. Um, in March of 53, uh, Dr. Salk announced on the radio that there was a, a new polio vaccine. Um, by 1988, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative was established with its goal being to reduce the incidence of polio worldwide by 99%, um, and it has succeeded. Actually, the goal is to eradicate polio, but so far we've reduced it by 99%. That's huge. Um, there are some places where polio is still very endemic, um, Nigeria, um, and on the borders between Pakistan and Afghanistan. So it's important to know that if you have patients who are traveling, that could be a risk factor for them, and they need to make sure they're adequately immunized. Today we use the IPV or the inactivated polio vaccine. It's actually recommended that if you're going to some place where it is endemic, that you receive at least one dose of the oral polio to boost your immunity up. Meningitis. When we look at uh, in the 50s and 60s, there was outbreaks of meningitis. This one specifically pertains to Fort Ord, California, where there's an army base and recruits were coming down with meningitis. Um, it lasted a long time. There were 13 deaths, as you see there. Um, so it was a major thing. They had to close the base to new recruits for a while in order to help eradicate it. Um, if you look at the, the chart on the right, this is meningitis cases in Texas looking from 2005 to 2009. And under bacterial, you can see in 2008 and 2009, there were no confirmed cases or probable cases. So that we have made progress in these areas. Homophilus influenza type B. Does any, has anybody ever seen a case of Homophilus influenza type B? Dr. Bowman, of course. Uh, 1976, exactly. I started my residency in uh, 1990, my pediatric residency in 1990, 1990 not 1890. Cool. Um, yeah, exactly. Some days it does. I have never seen a case of H flu. The vaccine um, was started, as you can see on here, around 19, it was approved for or licensed for children over the age of 18 months in around 1988. And since that time it started, it's just been dropping. Um, it was approved for infants in about 1990. And since about 1993, there just hasn't been much H flu. And that's a good thing. H flu caused epiglottitis, which could be a deadly disease if not caught quickly and handled appropriately, uh, and meningitis. Those were the major things. And we just don't see those anymore. We're very fortunate in regards to that. Rotavirus, this is a much more recent vaccine that we've acquired. Um, you can see in this blue zone, this is from 2000 to 2006, when they did stool samples and, and screened for the virus. It was running about 40% positives. Now, looking at um, 2007 through 2009, these peaks have dropped by about half. All right. So the introduction of that vaccine um, for rotavirus has had a huge impact. Rotavirus is the most common cause of gastroenteritis in children under the age of five. Right? And it's the cause of um, the, the largest cause of hospitalizations for gastroenteritis in the United States and a significant cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. So looking at this graph, this kind of tells you what happens when there's a disease process. We develop an immune, uh, a vaccine for it and how things go from there. So this is your disease process. Your disease is going along. A vaccine is developed, and the rate of vaccination increases over time, and the rate of disease falls. The blue line represents adverse events that can occur because of the vaccine. And we see that that gradually goes up. At some point in time, people get a little bit scared, whether there's an adverse event that makes the news whatever happened, uh, the rate of vaccination drops. During that time, the rate of disease increases again, and people begin to associate that and realize the importance of the vaccination. Vaccination rates increase again, the rate of disease falls again, until such time that it's actually eradicated, and you can stop vaccinations. 
That's what happened with smallpox. All right, we're fortunate that that is not around anymore. So this is a, an illustration of, of how you can see how immunizations can impact. Uh, this was looking at Japan. And in 1974, they had an 80% vaccination rate. Something happened in 75. I couldn't find the information on that, but something happened in 75 to cause them to stop vaccinating. There was a scare, all right? Prior to that, they had had 373 cases of pertussis with no deaths, all right? By 76, the rate is increasing. The, the, the rate of disease is increasing. The vaccination rate is only 10%. By 1979, they're up to 13,000 cases of pertussis with 41 deaths. Um, now, why it took them until 81 to begin vaccinating again, I'm not really clear on that. But in 81, they began vaccinating again. The rate of um, the number of cases of pertussis dropped. By 85, they were down to 1,000, 89, 500, and in 93, 130 cases. But you can see the dramatic impact vaccination has on childhood health and well-being and morbidity and mortality. Uh, the impact of vaccines is considered by some to be the single most important public health accomplishment of the 20th century. Um, so it, it has a huge impact, no matter how you look at it. Uh, this is looking at diseases um, baseline before we started vaccinating and the numbers of cases of those different diseases. This is those cases in 2008. You can see that all of these have been reduced dramatically. Um, all of them have been reduced by at least 95%, except for pertussis, which stands at 92.7 as of 2008. So huge impact of this vaccination process um, on eradicating some of the diseases or just really minimizing the effects it has on our society. This is another way of looking at the exact same information. These bubbles represent the burden of disease of each of these different diseases. This is early 1900s, and this is 2010. You can see the size, the measles is here, the yellow one comes down to this little bitty circle. All right. Some of these other ones become little specks. So the, the ratio of how they, I think it's helpful sometimes to just see that visual and know the dramatic changes that have happened with that. So between the last century and this one, vaccines have reduced the hospitalizations for measles, mumps, polio, rubella, tetanus, H flu, and varicella by more than 90%, and pertussis by 86%. When we were developing this talk, one of our purposes is to, is to um, look specifically at East Texas and look at the vaccination rates they have and how we can work to improve those. This looks at the number of actual cases of vaccine-preventable diseases in different regions of Texas. And what you may notice is some of these numbers don't look like you know, there's 99, there's a 783. Well, some of the other regions are metropolitan areas. So there's a much greater population density. When you're looking at East Texas, you're looking at a much more rural population. And so the numbers of these cases is very significant based on what their total populations are. All right. This is just looking again at that information in a different way, looking at the immunization rate rather than the incidence of disease. And we see that they are lower than the rest of the state. So looking at this from a provider perspective, um, most of us want to do, want to give vaccines, okay? It's, we consider it to be the right thing to do for our patients. But even though we want to, it's sometimes hard to accomplish that goal. Um, referring out to other sources may not be effective um, or successful. And every patient encounter needs to be considered an opportunity to immunize. From the family perspective, this is taken from a study published in Pediatrics in 2009. They, they sent out, I think, around 2,500 um, surveys, and they got back about 1,500. So they had a fairly good response. And they, this tells you how many strongly agreed or agreed with these statements. So when asked if they were a good way to protect their children from diseases, 90% said yes. So that's good. Um, I generally do what my doctor recommends about vaccines for my children, almost 90%. So we're doing really good. Uh, I'm concerned about serious adverse events, 50%. OK, and that makes sense. That doesn't mean they're not immunizing. They just have concerns in those areas, and they may want questions answered. 
Uh, new vaccines are recommended only if they are as safe as older vaccines. Only 51% agreed or strongly agreed with that. That means there's 50% or so who don't think that the new vaccines are as safe as things we've had before. Um, I think that's a spot where we as providers can really help to um, ease our patients' concerns in regards to the safety of vaccines that are out there today. 30% uh, believe parents should have the right to refuse for any reason. Um, there's 25% that believe vaccines cause autism in healthy children. All right, so there's a lot of um, different perspectives and attitudes coming from our patients that we as providers need to be aware of so that we can educate them appropriately. So the vaccine basics. Now most of you know way more about vaccines than this slide is going to demonstrate, but this is a way that you can relay that information for your patients if you're trying to help them understand what the purpose of vaccination is. So you describe it as a file, like an FBA, FBI file about a specific germ, and that's administered to the patient. Your body takes that information and puts it into storage, puts it into um, the file cabinets in each cell, so it's aware of what it's looking for. It's kind of like it's got these wanted posters all over the place. So when the antigen for that particular uh, disease is introduced into the body, they're going to recognize it. Say, hey, I recognize you. We're going to go after you. Um, over time, those files can get old. You know, if it's in my office, it falls behind the desk. You can't find it anymore. Your body forgets what it's looking for. And that's what booster shots are for, or to remind them, put that poster out there again so they can look at it and see, oh, yeah, we need to be identifying this when it comes into our area. Attenuated viruses are live viruses. So they take the live virus and they culture it and grow it in a media that's different from the human body. That causes the virus to change so that it's, it's different than when it started and it loses its virulence. So it's safe for us. We're not going to catch something when we get these vaccinations. It is possible for them um, to change their properties, again, back the other direction. So there still are some mi minor risks, but that's um, the attenuation helps get rid of most of the, the risks associated with that. Uh, and it still remains a live virus. The benefit of a live virus is it has a better uh, immune response. So one or two doses are going to stay with you for most of your life. All right. Um, an inactivated virus, these are different types of viruses. They take pieces and parts of a virus uh, or a bacteria, whatever, and put them into the vaccine so that your body can recognize it. But they are not whole, and they are not uh, alive. So they cannot cause you to catch whatever disease it is that you're immunizing for. They are easier to transport. If you're going to third world countries, it's easier to transport these type of vaccines. Um, they do require more booster doses over time, uh, and they, but they don't shed the active um, the viruses or anything, uh, the infectious agent. That's, you know, the classic thing, the important time to remember about live versus, not the only important time, but live versus um, inactivated vaccine is with the flu vaccine, which we're administering a lot of right now, and helping parents to understand that, you know, you cannot catch the flu from the injectable flu vaccine. It is not a live virus. You cannot catch it. Because um, we really need to get our immunization rates up with that one. Uh, one of the areas I find that's confusing for some individuals, whether it be the providers or the patients, is what is a true contraindication for giving a vaccine and what's just a precaution? They're not the same. A true contraindication is you don't give this vaccine to this patient, period. We don't do it. It's not safe. Contraind uh, a precaution is you want to look at each case individually and decide is there a significant risk for this patient, do your risks outweigh the benefits of administering the vaccine and take each one on a case-by-case -case basis. So true contraindications are anaphylactic response to a previous dose of that same vaccine. You're not going to give them any more of that. Uh, you have HIV, AIDS, or other immunodeficiencies. You're not going to administer live virus vaccines. And then there's certain contraindications that are specific for certain vaccines. So certain ones you don't give during pregnancy. Uh, and if you've had an encephalopathy developed within seven days of a previous DTP dose, then you don't administer any more of those. 
all right? The precautions tend to be less severe, all right? Although Guillain-Barre can be pretty significant, but there's a question of whether that's even related to vaccines uh, for some individuals. So you have to look. If they're sick, can you give the vaccine today? You have to look at how sick they are. What are their symptoms? Are they running a fever? Are they lethargic? What else is going on? Just to say that they're sick doesn't mean, you know, someone with strep throat can probably get their vaccine. All right. It's not going to be a hindrance to them. Um, someone who's severely dehydrated um, or some along those lines, you might reconsider and wait and put that off. And so this is just a list of different instances, precautions for specific vaccines. Now, this is looking at the adverse events associated with the disease versus the vaccine. And so you can see which, you're kind of weighing it, all right? Which is worse? Is the disease worse or is the vaccine worse? What we see with the vaccine is that the adverse events tend to be minor, you know, fever, rash, swollen glands. One in 3,000 might have a single seizure as a result of the vaccine. Joint stiffness or pain. Um, you can have low platelet count and bleeding. That's a little bit more significant. Allergic reaction, less than one per million. And then long-term seizure, brain damage, or deafness. Some say that may be associated, but there has never been any evidence to verify that it truly is associated with vaccination. As opposed to the disease itself, pneumonia, encephalitis, diarrhea, seizures, ear infections, and death. One or two children out of every thousand can die from measles. That's significant. Anytime a child dies of a vaccine-preventable disease, that's significant. So delivery, where do we come up with these vaccines anyway? Who decides that a vaccine is appropriate and should be um, distributed? There's a committee called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. All right? It's developed, uh, it's set up through the CDC. And they have broad representation of different um, of pediatricians, internists, family medicine, uh, and then other individuals as well, scientists, who help uh, establish what the criteria should be. They look at the epidemiology of a disease, how prevalent is it, what age groups are affected, what are the consequences of the disease. They look at what the risks are associated with the vaccination itself and weigh those together. Um, Vaccines are constantly looked at. They're constantly reevaluated. Um, they've been tested and retested. They have to go through a very long process in order to be approved. Um, and sometimes, as time goes by, we realize there needs to be changes in our recommendations. For instance, the measles vaccine, we used to only give one dose at a year of age. We found out that your immunity wanes and you do need a booster, and we've started giving that at four years of age. So as time goes by, we learn new things and we make changes appropriately. With the rotavirus vaccine, with the injection that was initially available, we found that there was an increased instance of intussusception for children who had had that vaccine. That vaccine was discontinued. New vaccines were developed, which are oral vaccines, and that incidence has not been shown to occur with those individuals. So it's important to know that these things are constantly being looked at. Uh, they look at how cost effective the vaccine is, um, it's a transparent process. Their meetings are open to the public. It's not a closed door session. Nobody knows what's going on until they suddenly make their announcements. They work with national organizations, so the AAP and the AAFP, uh, and they work with the Texas Pediatric Society in Texas. Um, so I think as providers, part of our job is to make sure our patients understand this is not just the drug company saying, I need to, we want to come out with this vaccine and we want you to give it to all your patients. There is a lot of discussion that goes into it, a lot of science that goes into it to develop these vaccines and truly make sure that they're safe for our patients. We need to promote the timeliness of vaccination, um, using an on-time vaccine schedule, um, making sure patients come back, figuring out ways to get them to follow up with you. There's no data to support than an alternative schedule is um, of an added benefit. Um, you're not doing anyone a favor by giving vaccines early. They'll say, oh, you're going to be you're going to be one next month. Let's go ahead and do your vaccines today. Not a good idea because many of these vaccines need to be given at a specific time. And if they're given early, they're just going to have to repeat them. 
So it doesn't make any sense to not follow the recommended guidelines. Um, we delayed the MMR and vaccine until after a year because of the uh, immaturity of the immune system and some of the um, carryover immunity that the mom has given to the infant. Why do we even have vaccine requirements? What's the difference? Well, if we are giving the vaccine to a large number of people, it's going to reduce the cost of the vaccine. Um, it's a public health measure. We have all heard about herd immunity. Herd immunity is when I'm not immunized, but everybody around me is, so I'm not exposed to the disease because I'm not, there's nobody around me that's going to catch it. They've been immunized, so I'm getting the added benefit of that protection. This is important for people who can't be immunized. If you have a child who's going through chemotherapy, it's important that everybody around them is immunized so that they're protected. Uh, we're going to reduce the morbidity and mortality of the disease if we vaccinate. And we do have specific criteria for entry into school. This is a complicated chart. I don't expect you to be able to understand it. But this tells us, as providers, what the requirements are in the state of Texas for a child to have before they enter school. Um, parents can sign a waiver that they don't want vaccines or they don't want specific vaccines, but there are certain requirements there. This one looks at specific requirements for child care facilities. So if you have a child who's going to go to daycare and the parent hasn't immunized up to this point, they need to be aware that if it's a licensed daycare facility in the state of Texas, they need to get immunized. Um, this is just the standard immunization schedule, and it's available for anybody. You can go to the CDC website, the American Academy of Pediatrics website. You can find it just about anywhere. And it's important as providers, if you're administering vaccine, to make sure that you know what that says, know what the schedule is. VFC is the vaccine for children. And this is a, a federally funded um, supply of vaccines that's distributed to the states. It was actually developed after the outbreak of measles that they saw from 89, 90, 91 that I talked about earlier. And they saw, they looked at these kids that were getting the measles and found that a very large percentage of them, or a high percentage of them, uh, had not been immunized. And one of the reasons was access to vaccines. Either they couldn't afford them or they weren't readily available in the doctor's office or something of that nature. So the Vaccine for Children's program was established after that time. If you're Medicaid eligible, you can get VFC. If you're uninsured, have no insurance, you can get VFC. Uh, American Indians or Alaskan Natives. And then underinsured, those are people who have, vaccine, uh, have coverage, but it may not cover vaccines. It may have a cap on the amount of vaccines it covers, um, or it may just cover certain vaccines. So those individuals are eligible for VFC. What are the barriers that we see in our practices as providers that limit us from giving vaccines? So the first one would be reimbursement. The cost of vaccines is very high. They are expensive. There's no two ways about it. So you've got the cost of the vaccines. You've got the cost of the um, syringes, the needles, um, the administration costs, of the staff it takes to keep those in order. That's a lot of costs associated with vaccination. Um, and some uh, insurance companies have actually um, not reimbursed for the full cost of the vaccine itself. So it's hard to motivate providers to want to vaccinate their patients if they're not only even going to get repaid at the cost of the vaccine. Um, and that's something that people are working on, but that is a, definitely a barrier. Uh, the knowledge of the providers just in terms of what vaccines are necessary, at what age, and what is the availability of those vaccines, that's important, and that can be a barrier for them to be administering to their patients. The logistics and staffing. Right, what else do I, do I need? Do I have the syringe? Do I have the needles? Do I have the staff that's trained to do them? Do they know how to do them? Do they know which ones are IM? Do they know which ones are sub-Q? Having that information available, that can be a barrier. Uh, liability. I think providers in general tend to worry about liability. None of us want to have um, that episode of something bad happens and the parent comes back and tells you it's your fault because you did that, because you administered a vaccine. So. There is that concern in some providers' minds. The vaccine for children. All right, you may have all these private stock vaccines that you're giving to your patients, but now you want to do VFC. That has to be stored separate from
from the other vaccines. It can be in the same refrigerator, but it has to be in a separate area. It has to be designated. This is VFC. This is my other stock. They can't be mixed together. You can't just go grab one and say, here, there we go. So there's a lot of logistics associated with just being a part of the VFC program. Um, so despite all the benefits, there can't be barriers created by that. Patient access. Sometimes if we're talking about uh, areas of the country that are more rural, it's hard sometimes for those patients to get in to where you are to get their vaccinations. Um, and so being cognizant of that and trying to make effort um, either to expand the hours of your practice, um, have certain days, Saturday, that they can come in and get vaccination so that they don't have to take off work. Trying to figure out ways to improve patient access um, can be helpful. And then the language barrier. We live in Texas. Um, there is a large Hispanic population. Um, there's other populations as well. And, and I think it's important for us to realize that if a patient or a parent can't understand my explanation for why this vaccine is important, that may be one of the major reasons that they are, not, they are going to choose not to immunize their child. So making sure that we have someone who can translate or having access to a translation system can help with that. So looking at barriers from the family's perspective, one of the major ones is just they're scared of the vaccine. They're scared of what's going to happen when you get the vaccine. All right. Classic example, you know, the flu shot. I'm not going to get the flu because, you know, I saw someone that got it and they got the flu. Or, you know, so-and-so had that happened and then they had a seizure. You know, you, it's, it's a lot of hearsay. And so it's important for us as providers to give them the facts of the vaccine. There's vaccine information sheets that can be distributed to patients that tells them all about the vaccine and the most common side effects to expect and what to do in, in different situations. So um, trying to allay those fears makes a big difference. Some patients have true religious uh, reasons for not wanting to get vaccination, and it's important to respect those, I think. Um, so that's why when a patient says they don't want it vaccines, you need to clarify why it is they don't want it vaccines. Childhood illnesses. There is a belief amongst a lot of people that if my child's sick, they can't get vaccinated. And my child always has a runny nose, so every time we go to the doctor, they say they can't vaccinate them. Well, that should not be the case. They should be able to get vaccinated, and it's important for us to reinforce that for them to help us make those decisions that the child looks good, not say, well, let's put it off till next time. Let's go ahead and do it today. Media. Um, I think everybody has probably heard of different individuals in the media who have um, made statements about vaccination um, and recommending against vaccination. These people get a lot of attention. Um, if you or I were to be on TV and say something about vaccination, people wouldn't pay much attention because, you know, we're not very exciting. But you put um, Jenny McCarthy out there or someone like that, and people listen to her, all right? Not because she has... Um, extensive knowledge on the subject, but she has a personal experience that they feel makes her able to speak to those issues. Uh, so the media tends to kind of blow those things out of proportion, make them into big deals. They get a lot of attention, and so patient, patients hear about that. Provider communication. Some of us don't do as good a job as others talking to our patients, and so that's just important that we try and make that effort to talk to our patients about what's going on and why these are important, and what to anticipate and expect. Patients haven't heard about some of these diseases. We talked, I showed you how some of these diseases have been more or less eradicated in the United States. So they don't know anybody who's had it. They've never heard of it. Why do we need to worry about it? And so we have to explain to them what the risks and the benefits for these different vaccinations are. And then it's just not convenient. You know, I've got to take off work got to go in, you know, I'm going to have to wait X amount of time before you even see me. My kids are going to be screaming when I leave the office. I really don't want to have to deal with that. So um, that's a real barrier for some parents. Now when we look at this, we can see that parents have certain barriers, providers have certain barriers, and there's some, some that overlap. If you don't have access to vaccines, um, if, you don't, if you don't have insurance coverage, if you're not on VFC, well, you are on VFC, but maybe your provider doesn't have VFC. That's going to make it difficult for you to get vaccination. So there's some things that are pertinent to both groups. So how do we become 
overcome those barriers. It's important to remember what can happen if we don't vaccinate. You know, remember the picture of the measles and how it started and there was not much, I mean, not measles, pertussis, and the rate of pertussis increased dramatically over time and then came back down. If we don't immunize, that can happen. You know, as the rate of immunization drops, the rate of disease increases and more and more children will be put at risk. And this is just illustrating some of the, the complications, morbidity and mortality that are associated with these different diseases that we've kind of become a little bit complacent about. You know, we just don't see it much anymore. So do we really need to worry about it? But even one child who, you know, um, develops brain damage because of varicella, that's, that's too many if we could avoid that by giving them a vaccination. Other ways to overcome barriers. Um, if you have any local resources to TV, radio, public service announcements, that sort of thing, to broadcast that information out there. When you know it's coming time for flu season, make sure that that information is made available so that people hear about it uh, instead of just, well, I haven't been sick, so I haven't been to my doctor's office, so therefore I didn't get my kids flu shots because I just didn't think about it. I didn't hear about it. We need to help make sure that that information is distributed. Um, there's a thing called shared medical appointments or group visits. When you have a larger number of patients come in all at one time, uh, and you can decide how it's done, whether it's walk-in or scheduled, whatever, but then they all are educated together, and then they get their vaccinations. And you're able to code and bill for those at a higher level than you would maybe if you just had, and more efficiently than if you just had one coming in at a time and seeing them one every 15 minutes. You get a lot of that group. Uh, information distributed, and then you progress from there. Uh, it's important to realize you're not going to make money vaccinating. That is not going to be the money maker of your practice. We do this as a service to our patients um, because we want them to stay healthy. If you provide immunizations in your office, you're allowing your patients to come to one place. Um, there's a lot of emphasis now on the medical home, and this is part of it, is being able to come to you and get everything that they need. Um, there's organizations in the state that can help with this. The, the Texas Pediatric Society or the Academy of Family Practitioners have some contract language that you can use when you're making contact with HMOs so that you will get reimbursed the optimal amount uh, for the vaccines that you're giving. A public health department has information. Uh, become a part of the VFC program. That's going to eliminate your vaccine costs and you're just going to have to account for the other things there. You can be reimbursed for administration fees as well. Um, we've learned in our practice that if I give a DTP vaccine, I can charge three administration fees because I'm giving three antigens, the diphtheria, pertussis, and the tetanus. So those are things that many of us aren't aware of, and unless you start looking and trying to find ways in which you can get um, code for those things, that's going to be helpful doesn't mean every insurance company is going to reimburse us for that. But if you don't code for it and you don't bill for it, you definitely won't get reimbursed for it. And then MTRAC is a state tracking system for immunizations. So when kids come in and get immunized, that information can be sent to MTRAC. For us, it goes straight through our EHR system. Um, it downloads on a periodic basis. So that information is received by them, and they have a file then. Most patients when they are in the hospital and get their hepatitis B vaccine at birth, the parents sign a permission slip that says, yes, I agree to this information being put uh, on MTRAC. Uh, if they haven't signed that, it needs to be signed in your office. But once it's there, they don't have to sign it again, and that's always accessible. It makes it, MTRAC makes it very easy for patients if there is a natural disaster, such in the case of Katrina. We had a lot of patients coming here from Louisiana who had lost their shot records, all right? They had nothing to show for what they had received up to that point, and many of those children had to start from scratch, had to start from the beginning and repeat, because we didn't have access to any kind of system that they had in, in um, Louisiana, and it wasn't well utilized in Louisiana. Now these systems are learning to talk to each other, uh, and they're learning that we need to give physicians in other states better access so that we can get this information across. So there's a six-point plan. We've kind of developed a six-point plan of, what, of ways that you can progress and improve immunization rates in your practice. So uh, 
identify what the specific barrier is for your practice. Um, for our practice, we had a problem for a while with when we converted to the EHR, a lot of the vaccine records weren't in there. So then when the patient came in and they wanted to be immunized, we didn't have the, and they, don't, they didn't bring a paper copy with them, and we didn't have a copy in our EHR. So then we had to go search out a paper chart that was in storage someplace so they could find out what the immunization practices were for that child before that. We've learned, we've improved that, we've pulled charts before patient um, visits, we check MTRAC. We've learned from that experience what to do to improve our ability to immunize children in a timely manner. So looking at your own practice and seeing what, what your situation is is very helpful. Educating your staff and educating your patients about the importance of the immunizations, what the expectations are, what you want to do. Um, some practices you will encounter patients who do not want to immunize or they want to use one of the alternative schedules. And as a provider, you have to decide whether that's acceptable to you or whether they, you don't want them to be a part of your practice. The American Academy of Pediatrics actually um, recommends that you not discharge these patients from your practice because then the risk is they aren't going to go see anybody. All right, You don't know who else is out there that might see them on an alternative schedule. So at least if you can see them and follow them, at some point you may be able to make a little breakthrough and, and encourage them that this is an important vaccination and maybe get them to vaccinate. Um, if they're not coming to see anybody, they're, not, they're for sure not going to get any vaccines. So uh, it's important to work on the education of everybody involved. Sometimes you can do rewards for patients. Uh, this should not say, well, it says parents are hesitant to vaccinate patient appropriately if they aren't screaming every time they leave the, leave the office. Oops. Um, that means that the child is screaming when they leave the office, not the parent usually. Uh, use available community resources and influence. Collaborating with other providers. Uh, maybe I can't provide, I don't have a freezer that can store my varicella vaccine, but you do. Would you be willing to accept my patients for their varicella vaccination? And maybe we can figure a way to trade off. You're going to be able to bill for the varicella. That's not a problem. So figuring out ways that you can accomplish that um, is important. So working with other providers. Because uh, our common, our goal is the same. We want to immunize the children. Uh, working with the local health department, health fairs, setting up Friday clinics just for vaccination, those kind of things are going to be very helpful. Um, looking at your state organizations and see what they can offer you in terms of educating your patients, handouts, all that kind of stuff, and then national organizations as well. Structure your office so it's vaccine friendly. Every time a patient comes in, someone should be checking their shop record. What immunizations have they have? What do they need? What can they receive today? We want to do that every time. And have someone in your office that's kind of the advocate for vaccines. It's not you, somebody else, so that you don't have added burdens onto your, your set of things you have to do, but someone who's going to be helping encourage that amongst the staff and making sure that actually happens. Um, making sure people ask when they come in for a well visit, are we doing shots today? If we are, they can look, if they're educated, they can look at the shot record, see what's going to be needed, and prepare those vaccines ahead of time so they're ready when, as soon as you order it. They can go in, or some places may have um, standing orders for specific vaccines at certain ages. Um, let's see, I think I covered all those things. Optimize your reimbursement. Again, this is going back to looking at what you have available in your office, um, and how can you maximize that? Uh, the shared office visits, enrolling in the VFC program, and then contacting all these other agencies. To, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. A lot of these places have already looked at this and developed ways to maximize your, your reimbursement so you don't have to start from zero. And then using the immunization registry. If everybody puts all their patients' vaccination records into the immunization record uh, registry, we will have constant access. When a patient goes from seeing one provider to another, doesn't, we don't have to wait for a week for the, for the chart to get sent over or faxed over. Um, we don't have to worry about the patient's going to go home and pick it up and bring it back so they can show us and we can copy it. It will be right there. If we're all putting it in, it's going to be accessible to everybody, and that's going to improve the vaccination um, rates for all of our patients. There are tons and tons of resources 
um, it's in the it's it's in the handout. There are websites galore to give you wonderful information about immunizations. Unfortunately, there are websites galore to give you negative information about vaccination. Part of our job is to help our patients understand which ones are the good sites and which ones are the not so good sites, which ones we support and why we support them. Um, go and look at some of those others so you know what's out there. There's people spouting conspiracy theories. There's people out there saying it causes X, Y, and Z, all sorts of things. But if you don't go out and look, it shocked me as I was preparing for this, the number of negative sites as I was just screening. Oh, that looks like a good one. Boom. You know, um, that's exactly what your patients are doing. And if that's the first one that pops up for them, that's the one they're going to read first. And that's going to stick with them if they don't have any other information. So it's important for us to provide appropriate information for them. Uh, Dr. Brown is a doctor in uh, Houston, I believe, who wrote a book, and she has taken a section from that book um, and made it into pamphlets that are available for distribution to families. Um, and it gives them information about the vaccines, the side effects, autism, um, mercury, all those kind of questions that patients have. Here's a lot of state inf information. Uh, we're fortunate that Dr. Murphy, who's part of the AAP chapter of immunization, um, He's actually located at Cook, so he's a resource that we have locally. There's an app for that. There is. There are apps available to help you determine vaccination for children. So a child comes in, you're trying to figure out what vaccines they need, you're looking at that chart, it's all garbled up, you can find it on the app and it will help direct you to what vaccinations that child needs. Having something simple for parents to look at before they leave the office, so they can take it with them, and it's going to show them what vaccines are needed at what point in time. Uh, it's also important when they come to see us that we say something to them before they leave. Next time I see you will be 12 months, and he will be due for vaccinations at that time. He'll be getting the MMR, the chickenpox, and the hepatitis A. If you prepare them mentally for that and, and put that little reminder in, they're more likely to remember to schedule that appointment and come back for that appointment. Lots of other resources. Any questions? Uh, the challenge of, of exporting vaccines to developing countries. I don't know a lot about that. That's not an area of my expertise. Um, yes, there's just the, the mechanical part of it, uh, keeping them at the appropriate temperature, making sure that you have the appropriate diluents for the certain vaccines. Um, there's a lot of international organizations. The World Health Organization does a lot with that. Um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has established a lot of support to developing countries to administer vaccines. So I think they take care of some of those logistics that it's not something individuals are having to work on. It's large groups that are managing that. The question is, what about the concerns of taking many of the vaccines together? They have shown, and repeated studies have been done, to show that there is not a risk associated with that. And in fact, if you look at the number of germs or bacteria or viruses, the children are exposed to every day, a child in daycare, for instance. They are actually the burden of uh, the level of bacteria and all kinds of stuff they're being exposed to is greater than what we administer with many of our vaccines. So on a daily basis, they're encountering that. Your body, your immune system is made to handle that, to handle that response. So it is safe. The Marisol has been removed from vaccines, um, except for multi-dose vaccines, which is usually just the flu, and you can even get that for children under three that does not have the marisol in it. So um, that doesn't tend to be a good word.